in the heavens. One spectacular planet stands apart in its awesome beauty. Beyond Mars in the vast asteroid belt is a set of four massive planets which are far different from our own and the other terrestrial planets. One of them, Jupiter, is so massive that it outweighs all the other planets, moons, and debris in the solar system combined. But at twice Jupiter's distance, nearly one billion miles from the sun, lies the remarkable planet Saturn, encircled by a halo of brilliant white rings and a family of numerous moons. Since the time of Galileo, Saturn has fascinated its earthly observers. The image of Saturn is well known with its rings and yet still so striking that it can't fail to impress people when they do see it for that very first time. Saturn is similar at least to the planet Jupiter. Its disk seems to have bands and belts on it as Jupiter does, but the belts aren't as numerous and they're not as well defined nor are they as colorful as what we see on Jupiter. Saturn's not as large as Jupiter either, but still it's a large planet. To get to Saturn, we would have to travel out past the realm of the terrestrial planets, through the asteroid gap, we'd reach Jupiter, and we'd only be halfway, for Saturn is 10 astronomical units away from the Sun. That's 10 times the distance between the Sun and the Earth. At that vast distance, it takes nearly 30 years for Saturn to travel once around the Sun. The planet Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It's nearly 10 times bigger than the Earth. So whereas the Earth is about 8,000 miles in diameter, Saturn is nearly 80,000 miles in diameter. It's one of the fastest rotators. It goes once around in about 10 and a half hours. And so what's interesting is if you could stand on the equator of Saturn, which you probably can't, uh, you would be traveling over 20,000 miles an hour just due to this rapid rotation. The planet Saturn is quite different from the terrestrial planets in that it's made of primarily hydrogen and helium. In fact, it is so light, its density is so low that if there was an ocean that was large enough, Saturn would actually float. To the naked eye, Saturn is not, not particularly significant. It's about as bright as a first magnitude star, say the star Spica that's out there in, in Virgo. But it's through a telescope that Saturn becomes interesting uh, because of its magnificent system of rings. The rings were first observed by Galileo in the early 1600s, although his telescope was so crude that he wasn't able to see anything more than the fact that there were some sort of protuberances sticking out from the planet, and so we call it the planet with ears. And it wasn't until Christian Huygens in 1655, uh, using a much better telescope, was able to actually identify the fact that, that the rings are multitudes of particles. They're like satellites that orbit the planet in the plane of its equator. And it's these rings that have called so much attention to the planet Saturn. And the rings are huge. If, if the planet itself is 80,000 miles in diameter, the rings are two and a half times larger than that. So that's nearly 200,000 miles in diameter is this ring structure. And yet, they are so thin, they're no more than a mile or two thick. So comparatively, that's thinner than a piece of tissue paper. Many scientists believe that the giant outer planets may hold the secrets to the origin of the solar system, that they've changed little since their formation, and that their hydrogen-rich atmospheres may be similar to the Earth's atmosphere in its geologic past. Mended spacecraft to explore the outer solar system. 
Pioneer 11 in a sense the Scout, passed Saturn in 1979. The two Voyagers, launched in mid-1977, flew past Jupiter in 1979. Each spacecraft, using Jupiter's enormous gravity, is accelerated on towards Saturn, with the first having arrived there in November 1980. Dr. Rich Terrell, a member of the Voyager project team, describes the structure of the Voyager spacecraft and its remarkable array of scientific instruments. This is a replica of the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, in the center are the housed the computers uh, which are responsible for the sequencing and control of Voyager. Above it, a uh, very large high-gain antenna uh, required for communication with Earth at the very large distances of Voyager. Uh, reaction control jets and thermal louvers uh, responsible for cooling the spacecraft, keeping it at the right temperature, and maintaining its orientation as it uh, images uh, the planets. Affixed to the side is a golden record uh, put there uh, for possible communication if Voyager is ever found by some other alien uh, civilization. On this end, uh, inside this canister, is a 50-foot magnetic boom, which extends in the uh, spacecraft. On the end of it is a magnetometer. It's put on the end of this boom to keep it away from the metal on the spacecraft so it can measure magnetic fields of the planets. Extending out on this end of the spacecraft are the science antenna for the radio science and uh, radio astronomy experiments. On this boom over here are three radio isotope generators uh, responsible for powering Voyager. Since Voyager is so far away from the sun, solar panels are useless. So we use these generators to create heat and electricity for the rest of the spacecraft. Uh, segregated as far away as possible from these generators, we have the science platform on Voyager. Uh, this is a movable scan platform which enables you to uh, target these instruments uh, at various uh, satellites or the planet itself. We have the two cameras, the wide angle and narrow angle cameras for the imaging system, a photopolarimeter, uh, an infrared device, and an ultraviolet experiment. We also have plasma ray experiments and charged particle experiments on the scan platform. Uh, if all goes well, uh, in 1989, 12 years after Voyager was launched, um, these instruments will be looking at the planet Neptune. Of course, in 1986, they'll be looking at Uranus. Uh, we think with the generators on board, we'll have enough power on Voyager to get data back 30 years from now as Voyager crosses the heliopause, that is the uh, magnetic realm of the sun, and go off into interplanetary space. This computer-generated film produced by NASA allows us to virtually ride along with Voyager 1 as it made its encounter with Saturn in 80. We join Voyager 31 hours before closest approach. The spacecraft carries 10 instruments to make high-resolution studies. Before Voyager reaches Saturn, it approaches huge Titan, largest moon in the solar system and one that has an appreciable atmosphere. Voyager will fly behind Titan, bigger than the planet Mercury. As Voyager vanishes behind Titan and then reappears, its instruments study the way sunlight changes and its radio signals pass through the atmosphere and route to Earth, allowing measurements impossible from Earth. After passing Titan, Voyager once again turns its scan platform to Saturn and its exciting rings. As we approach the planet, we dip below the rings and see sunlight pass through them, providing a backlit view. Meanwhile, Voyager studies other satellites, such as Tethys. The great block of ice is an entirely different class than other satellites we've studied. As Voyager 1 draws ever closer to Saturn, it dips toward the South Pole. 
Voyager finally flies past the evening side of Saturn, only 124 kilometers from the clouds, as it then disappears once again from our view here on Earth to make the same kind of measurements that were made behind Titan. Another of Saturn's celestial escorts is icy Mimas. Voyager continues past Saturn, searching the night side for signs of lightning and auroras. And now the spacecraft begins to climb upward again. And then the sun and Earth reappear, and we reacquire the radio signal. Voyager crosses the rings through a narrow slot swept clear by the satellite Dione. The next satellite target is Rhea. Voyager performs some fancy footwork, tracking the speeding satellite as a gunner might lead his flying target. As Voyager continues to climb out of the Saturn system, it performs a roll maneuver to keep the antenna pointed at Earth and to prepare to measure the environment around Saturn. Now Titan again comes into the view of Voyager cameras. Almost 22 hours after closest approach to Saturn, Voyager maneuvers to scan the entire sky. First a small roll maneuver, then a full circle on the yaw axis, then almost two full circles on the roll axis before returning to lock on the star called Vega. This is Saturn's most mysterious satellite, Iapetus. The leading edge is six times darker than its trailing edge, and there is no satisfactory explanation. Steadily leaving Saturn, the spacecraft continues to look back over its shoulder at a constantly receding planet. Voyager heads out of the solar system. Shortly after Voyager 1's Saturn encounter, Project scientists at JPL offer some early reactions to the initial data transmitted by Voyager. So I'm sure you'll be interested in a little bit about some of the wind systems that we have been seeing for the first time on Saturn, particularly just how fast the cloud systems actually move. Uh, you can see in this particular picture of Saturn the rather banded structures. So we've now been able to look at the wind speeds towards the equatorial region near where the ring shadow exists. We found rather extraordinary that the winds are very much faster here than they are on Jupiter. In fact, the wind speeds are 400 meters per second, which is almost uh, 900 miles per hour. So the cloud systems are moving very much faster than the other systems that we've followed yet in the solar system. We did expect to find high winds rather like the Jovian system. The questions which we are now wrestling with is not only why the wind so fast but also why as you look at this the planet you can see the belts and zones it's rather more subtly colored than we saw on Jupiter but the fact is that it is a large belt of the cloud systems it's almost to about 20 to 30 degrees in each hemisphere which are moving at these great speeds so these are the questions that we're now wrestling with but more interesting Saturn also has a red spot and this is the red spot we've seen in the southern hemisphere it's about five or six thousand kilometers long and we believe it has all the same sorts of characteristics of the red spots on jupiter so here is an interesting similarity between the two planets we already knew from uh, the pioneer saturn encounter that saturn like jupiter had an immense magnetic field that extended some six hundred thousand miles at a minimum from uh, from saturn and that it, uh, we did learn with Voyager uh, 1, however, last January already, that that magnetic field was rotating with a period of 10 hours and 39 minutes. So one has to imagine this immense structure rotating very, very rapidly. Mm. And that uh, really leads to, to some rather interesting physics that uh, we studied with a very close flyby. If we look at this uh, one sketch, um, what we see here uh, is a, uh, an artist's sketch of a cross-section of the uh, of Saturn's magnetosphere, and the darker areas here represent the region where there are trapped particles, Van Allen belt radiation, and that whole magnetic field of Saturn is, is constrained to, to remain within this dark band, which we call the magnetopause, and that's because there is a solar wind, a supersonic wind from the sun blowing in from the left and compressing Saturn's magnetic field to be uh, constrained within that region. And because the solar wind is supersonic, 
a bow shock, very much like a supersonic aircraft sets up, uh, appears out in front of the magnetosphere. From the, uh, from the Earth, uh, the satellites appear as mere points of light. Uh, within a period of about uh, 12 to 18 hours, they pass from being points of light to being real um, uh, worlds. And we got good looks at many of them with Voyager 1, and we hope to get an even better look at a couple of them with, uh, uh, with Voyager 2. Uh, the first of the larger moons out from Saturn is Mimas, and uh, our pictures of that quite early on showed uh, evidence of very heavy cratering. Mimas is a uh, uh, rocky ice ball approximately 200 uh, kilometers in radius, and uh, it has at least one large crater on it that uh, we believe may even have been in the size range that uh, came close to being large enough to have disrupted the, um, the satellite entirely. Uh, we've dubbed this uh, facetiously the, the Death Star picture. It bears a certain resemblance to Hollywood prop. Uh, it's got a very low density, indicating that it must be mostly ice with only a small rocky composition. This is rather different from the uh, uh, satellites of Jupiter we looked at, which were about 50% rock, 50% ice. Uh, the next moon out was Enceladus. We didn't get a terribly good look at uh, Enceladus on um, uh, the first uh, mission through with Voyager 1. Uh, but it was close enough to tantalize us. It uh, begins to look as if Enceladus may have some internal processes going on it, uh, possibly driven by uh, tidal energy, again, as in the case of Europa and uh, Io. And they were still working out the relationship between all the bodies we saw and some of the things that have been discovered in the past few years from ground-based photography. But uh, essentially, before Voyager, there were... Months after the November 1980 encounter with Saturn, Dr. Rich Terrell provides a more detailed analysis of the data received from Voyager. Voyager found uh, the three classical ring elements on, uh, on Saturn were indeed very different. Uh, the A, B, and C ring were very different. It found an enormous amount of structure in the Cassini division. Uh, it found a braided, a twisted appearance on the very thin F ring. Uh, it found the D ring, a new ring inside the visible rings of Saturn. It found the G-ring, a very thin and faint ring outside the visible rings of Saturn, and it imaged the E-ring, a still fainter and diffuse ring, very far outside the visible rings. Uh, it also found a collection of uh, spoke-like features, which were uh, unknown before, rotating within the ring system, uh, which we have still have difficulties explaining and understanding. Uh, we also have a collection of new small satellites which exist outside, just outside the visible ring system, which we believe now influence a lot of the structure in the rings. The, the A, B, and C ring look very, very different. They look different from the ground-based observer, and that's why they were called A, B, and C. When we get close, those differences still remain. The, the C ring is composed of a, uh, a series of, uh, of very transparent uh, structures, very diffuse looking structures. It's the innermost ring, uh, except for the very faint D ring, which we can talk about later on. The, uh, there's a very sharp boundary between the C ring and the next ring out, which is the B ring. A very, very thick, really thick, uh, opaque ring. You cannot see through it. The, the boundary between the two rings is very sharp on a scale of our highest resolution, which was about 10 kilometer resolution. Very sharp boundary. There's no hint of a gap or any kind of structure which is causing that boundary. Uh, as we go further out, we have the Cassini division, and beyond the Cassini division, the A ring. And the A ring, again, is very, very different than the, the, the B ring or the C ring. The A ring uh, does not have very many features in it. There are very broad areas uh, where the ring is uh, uh, homogeneous, uh, very, very uh, featureless. The B ring, however, is riddled with hundreds and hundreds of little tiny ringlet features within it. Um, so we need separate explanations for structure in each of these rings. Cassini division is a very interesting feature. Um, many people who have looked through Saturn through a ground-based telescope have seen it, and it appears as a dark gap in the rings. For many years, it was thought to be a, a gap in the rings. So our understanding was that Mimas was the cause of the Cassini division, a very simple explanation for this feature. Uh, Pioneer, when it flew by Saturn, found uh, hints of material inside this Cassini division. Voyager, as it flew by, found a great deal of structure in the Cassini division. There are at least five broad bands within the division, so there are rings inside a division. We found features, gaps in those rings, so we had, you know, it, it got to be 
Saturn's rings with a gap in it, with rings in the gap, with gaps in the rings in the gap, and we found rings in the gaps and the rings in the gap. You know, so so it it was this you know the the, the Chinese puzzle of uh, bottles inside bottles. And the closer we looked, the more structure we found. Well, Voyager, uh, unlike many of the other planetary encounters, uh, was a very, very unique uh, encounter. We've often gotten surprises. We've gotten surprises in, uh, in Mariner 10 when it discovered a, ma a magnetic field around Mercury. But we understood magnetic fields. We've seen them around other planets. So it was a surprise, but it was an explainable surprise. We were uh, stunned at volcanism on Io which was discovered around Jupiter. Uh, but we understood volcanism, and we even understood a mechanism why Io should be uh, very volcanically active. The rings were another question. We found spokes in the rings. We found this braided F ring. We found this tremendous amount of structure, which uh, classically was, structure was explained with resonances, but we found more structure than we can explain with resonances. Um, so. The difference in Voyager being a, a true mission of discovery, we knew far less about Saturn than we knew about many of the other planets we've we visited with our spacecraft. Uh, the true shock there was discovering all these things and not being able to readily explain them. You know, it, it's not the kind of thing where you see an image and a half hour later you've got a theory which explains it. Uh, it's been months since the encounter and our theories are still evolving. And indeed, we're going to require Voyager 2 to fly by in order to help us explain many of these theories. It's a, it's a, it's a very different kind of uh, encounter, not to be... It's a very exciting encounter. We know now that most of the ring material is water ice particles contaminated with various types of dirt, ranging in size from dust grains to house-sized boulders with perhaps a few kilometer-sized moonlets. But several years after the Voyager encounters, the complex ring structure is only beginning to be understood. Saturn's thin braided F ring is just one of the lingering puzzles. Uh, when we first looked at it, it was a, a very thin necklace-like ring. Outside the main structure of the visible rings was Saturn. We looked at it in detail, we found it was a multi-stranded ring and the strands appear to weave in and out of each other, almost like a braided effect. Uh, this, is, this was a problem uh, to explain this. But we now understand that the F-ring is a very, very complicated feature. For one thing, it's a shepherded ring. That is, it has a satellite orbiting just inside the ring and one orbiting just outside the ring. We understand that the physics of this kind of uh, geometry uh, creates a uh, a focusing, a gravitational focusing result, which, which causes material to bunch up within a ring. The uh, next thing we found out was that the F ring has a great deal of small particles, dust. Well, in that kind of environment uh, at Saturn, within its magnetic field and the electrical fields created by uh, material moving in a magnetic field, you can get dust moving uh, in non-gravitational sense, uh, pulled out by the magnetic and electrical fields. Uh, thirdly, is we found a set of larger particles within the ring, a kilometer, even maybe even ten of ki tens of kilometer size objects within the F ring. So now we've got small dust, large shepherding satellites, and fairly large ring particles uh, within the dust. It's a combination of all these uh, interactions which are probably giving us the complicated structure. We can make simple-minded models uh, to try to understand these interactions one at a time. And when we do that, we find out that the result is very, very complex. Uh, we think that if we were to model all of these forces pulling on ring particles one way or the other, we would probably uh, uh, get the, uh, the braided structure of the rings. But we haven't done that quite yet. Explanations of the detailed ring structure are proving to be more complex than anyone imagined. The detailed structure in the rings, we think, uh, have uh, several explanations depending on where you are in the rings. For a very long time, people uh, tried to understand the physics of uh, the external satellites causing resonances in the rings. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the structure in the A-ring, the outermost of the very wide rings of Saturn, uh, are caused by these resonant, uh, resonant interactions. And they are basically two kinds. One of them is called a density wave, which turns out to be a uh, compression in the ring, 
caused by the gravitational attraction of the external satellites. And what these cause are, uh, are compressions in the rings which form tightly wound spirals, which uh, spiral outward. And the physics which causes these things is identical to the physics which causes spirals and spiral galaxies. So we have uh, more or less an excellent model for studying galactic structure right here in our own backyard at Saturn. A second kind of feature we found in the A-ring are corrugation waves, uh, actual uh, warps in the ring caused by the satellites being out of Saturn's ring plane, actually pulling material up and below uh, Saturn's ring plane. And here we have uh, what are effectively corrugations or uh, mountains, if you will, in the rings, and they can become as high as about one kilometer. Uh, they also form very tightly wound spirals, except they spiral inward. So much of the structure in the A-ring is explained by these two kinds of resonant features. Uh, the B-ring is a different story. Uh, in Voyager 1, we saw a, uh, a great multitude of structures in the B-ring. Uh, we call them ringlets, little rings. Separated between the ringlets, we have gaplets. And one simple-minded idea that we had at Voyager 1 was that the ringlets uh, are separated by gaplets, and the gaplets are caused by moonlets, little or actually somewhat larger ring particles, kilometers or so in diameter, uh, rotating around in the rings, spreading out the, or clearing these gaps. That was our theory. Uh, the proof for, uh, or actually the uh, negative result of the theory came with Voyager 2. When we looked very hard at these ringlets and gaplets and found that the gaplets were not in fact gaps. We expected to see many, many breaks or interruptions in the rings where we could see through them, and in fact we didn't. Uh, the moonlet theory went out the window, at least for all this large-scale structure in the rings. We now believe that structure is caused by an instability in the rings, which causes material into these ringlets uh, and, and causes structure between them. A lot of the structure we found is transient. Uh, it's like a wave structure, and when we come back a few hours later and look at it again, the features don't match up. Uh, we now, again, we believe that these features are, are similar to, uh, for instance, if you drop a, a little uh, pebble in a pond of water, you get these ripples. At any given time, you see these as a, as a coherent set of, uh, of structures. But if you compare a picture with a picture a few seconds later, the, the, the features don't match up exactly.